Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Uh, my name is Zach Ibrahim, and I'm here today to share some stories from my life in the hopes of illustrating that no matter what path you're put on, you can choose to promote peace. Before I begin, I feel the need to explain that my story is in no way a description of the vast majority of Muslim family life, both here in America and abroad. In fact, when people take the time to interact with one another, it doesn't take long to realize that for the most part, we all want the same things out of life. A job with a decent wage, a safe environment to educate our children, and to live in a community that doesn't chastise us for our beliefs. However, in every religion, in every population, you'll find a small group of people who hold so fervently to their beliefs that they feel they must use any means necessary to make others live as they do. Being raised in the home of a Muslim zealot, I've been exposed to many of the things that people fear about Islam. Yet I stand here promoting peace. This would be impossible in a world where we hang on to our old prejudices. I'm here to dispel some of the stereotypes that certain politicians and media pundits attempt to project into mainstream society. I feel that I can use my experience to combat those who would take advantage of people's fears for their own ends. Because of political opportunists who use the more radical elements of Islam to generalize the beliefs of all Muslims, but also because of extremist groups themselves who believe that the lives of innocent people are fair game on the ideological battlefield, I'm compelled to speak up. Now, it's a foolish mistake to believe religious extremism is exclusive to Islam. Unfortunately, there are endless examples in every belief system of relig religiously motivated violence. But as a society, we cannot ostracize entire communities for the actions of a few. In fact, if history is any indication, in a free society, there will always be acts of terrorism perpetrated in the name of one's beliefs. But by ostracizing the innocent, we tear apart the fabric of our society, which only works to foment the next generation of intolerance. Now, it may come as a surprise to some that although I was raised in the religion of Islam, I'm no longer a Muslim. That has little to do with my feelings on the religion itself. And in fact, I only bring it up to point out that I'm not here advocating for any particular religious belief. I'm simply here to share my stories and the lessons that I learned from them. Now, having said that, I'd like to illustrate the path that I was put on as a child by my father, who for most of my life has resided in maximum security prisons. This was a special Friday for me. I was a normal six-year-old staring at the chalkboard, waiting for the three o'clock bell to ring so that I could escape from school. But that day, my father was waiting in the hallway early. He said, Salaam Alaikum, which means peace be upon you. And I replied, Wa Alaikum Salaam and peace be upon you, the proper way for two Muslims to greet one another. He tells me that we're going to the mosque for Friday prayer where the blind Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman was to preach. You see, at midday every Friday, millions of Muslims around the world gather into mosques to listen to sermons given by Sheikhs. The Quran, the sacred text of Islam, says that praying in a group brings you more blessings than praying alone making Friday prayer the most blessed prayer of the week. That day, well, I should say that most clerics preach harmony between Muslims and non-Muslims, believing that there is a place in this world for all of its inhabitants to live in coexistence. The blind sheikh was not one of those men. He sat at the front of the worshipers with a microphone attached to his collar. And I tried my best to mimic my father as he listened intently to the Sheikh's words. That day, the Sheikh argued that Western culture was corrupting Muslims all over the planet, that the consequences of Western democracy were materialism, sexual perversion, and idolatry meant to distract believers from the true word of God, laying the blame for the Muslim world's ills on many of the same groups that Jerry Falwell blamed for 9-11 pagans, feminists, and gays. But the Sheikh saved his most venomous words for that of the nation of Israel. He spoke of interference and collusion by the United States and its Western allies to further their agenda 
at the expense of Muslim nations. And he used that support to foment the emotions of his congregation. He also claimed that the United States had persevered in its Cold War with the Soviet Union by using the hearts and bodies of Muslims as a military and economic strain, and that once the Soviets fell, America discarded those Afghan fighters like trash on the side of the road. When the Sheikh finished his sermon, my father took my hand and led me toward the front. This wasn't the first time I had met the Sheikh. In fact, I had spent more than a few nights either at the mosque or at one of my father's friend's houses, or even in our own living room, sitting on the floor listening to the Sheikh and the other men discuss religion and politics. I realized it was always somewhat ominous exchanging words with the Sheikh after one of his sermons. And it's looking back now that I realize even in a room full of people vying for his attention, his mind was somewhere else. Probably still wrapped with the passion and anger he clearly conveyed in his speech. On the drive home that afternoon, I wondered to myself what made the Sheikh and his followers so intensely devout. I asked my father, when did you become such a good Muslim? And he responded, when I came to America and saw everything that was wrong with it. And in that instant, I saw the same look on his face that I had seen earlier on the Sheikh's. Our family dynamic began to change soon after. It was during that time at the height of the Afghan war that I was forced to say goodbye to one of my best friends. His stepfather took him and his siblings from their home in New Jersey to Pakistan to train and then eventually fight in Afghanistan. He was 10 years old at the time. Because of his inexperience, he was used to lob grenades at the enemy's occupying forces. And when he'd returned to America less than a year later where once there stood a happy, vibrant child, now stood a solemn veteran of the Afghan war. He was a shadow of his former self. His innocence taken from him by a war he had no business being a part of. This is what happens when we use violence as a resolution of conflict. In a back and forth effort to gain even the slightest strategic advantage against one's enemies, Man has gone to lengths that seem inconceivable to those who are sheltered from the negative effects of war. But make no mistake, humanity has shown that it's willing to exploit almost any resource, even the lives of children, all in the name of one ideology or another. Each time we resort to war, whether as a means of resolving conflict or for spreading some ill-conceived notion of freedom, we guarantee an escalation and desensitization of violence in our culture. The summer after I turned seven, my grandfather came to America from Egypt to visit our family. Little did he know my father had brought him here to try and convince him to take my family back to Egypt so that my father could go fight in the Afghan war. You see, at the time, the United States was secretly funding the Mujahideen, the Muslim men and sometimes children who were going to Afghanistan from all over the world to fight. My grandfather's response was, absolutely not. If you want to make jihad, stay here and take care of them. Now let's take that word jihad for example. If you were to ask the average person, what do you think jihad means? They may say that it's an act of terrorism or that it means holy war. But there are many definitions to the word jihad. In reality, jihad can be something as simple as providing for your family. It's only the extremists and those who wish to generalize that reduce the word to a destructive act. And it was with that lesson that I learned that jihad can simply mean striving to live a moral and virtuous life. My grandfather, went back home thinking that he had won the argument. But my father was left only frustrated and unwilling to find a nonviolent outlet for those frustrations. On November 5th, 1990, when I was seven years old, my father assassinated a man. That man was Rabbi Meir Kahana, the leader of the Jewish Defense League. The JDL, as it was called, was described by the federal government as the largest terrorist organization operating inside the United States at the time. 
While attempting to flee the scene, my, also, my father was also shot by a federal postal officer, and he and Meyer Kahana were rushed to the hospital with similar gunshot wounds. Kahana died at Bellevue Hospital that night. My father lived. Although initially acquitted of the murder while serving time on assault and weapons charges, he began planning attacks on a dozen New York City landmarks, including tunnels, synagogues, and United Nations headquarters. Thankfully, those plans were foiled by an FBI informant. Sadly, the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center was not. My father, Al Sayed Nocera, would eventually be convicted for his involvement in the plot. A few months prior to his arrest, he sat me down and explained that for the past few weekends, he and some friends had been going to a shooting range for target practice. And he told me I'd be going with him the next morning. And to be honest, I was so excited I could barely sleep that night. And my excitement once again began to mount the next morning when we got into the car. We arrived at Calverton shooting range on Long Island, which unbeknownst to our group was being watched by the FBI. We walked together towards the group of men huddled by the trunk of a car, and inside were a range of weapons. When it was my turn to shoot, my father helped me hold a rifle to my shoulder and explained how to aim at the target about 30 yards off. I was so nervous, my palms were sweating. I gently squeezed the tr trigger, and my ears rang, and the noise echoed through the woods that surrounded the range and a small knot showed where the bullet had broken through the canvas. Hearing the praise from the men around me, and with my father looking over my shoulder, smiling, it was one of my proudest moments. He seemed to be having almost as much fun as I was, if not more. Using a fully automatic weapon, he shot the legs out from under one of the larger targets, causing it to come crashing to the ground. And the men all shouted and had a laugh. But by late morning, it began to softly drizzle, and I knew our time at the range was coming to an end. So on my last turn, I took aim at the target and let each bullet fly. The last one hit the small orange light that sat on top of the target. And to everyone's surprise, especially mine, it burst. And as I stood there, I heard my uncle say to the other men, Ibn Abu like father, like son. They all seemed to get a really big laugh out of that comment, but it wasn't until a few years later that I fully understood what they thought was so funny. Those men would eventually be convicted of placing a van filled with 1,500 pounds of explosives into the sub-level parking lot of the World Trade Center's North Tower, causing an explosion that killed six people and injured over 1,000 others. These were the men I looked up to. These were the men I called Ammo, which means uncle. It saddens me to think that had they not committed this crime, the innocent victims killed in the attack would be at home spending time with their loved ones. Instead, their families are forced to live their lives without their guidance and companionship. I was seven years old when my father went to prison. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't wish he had chosen a peaceful life with his family. Instead, he exposed me from a very young age to the intolerance and radical nature of extremism. And yet I stand before you all today with this simple message, that no matter the level of violence you've been exposed to, it doesn't have to define your character. That in all of us is the ability to change our paths. I spent years of my young life visiting him in different prisons. Rikers Island, the federal prison in Manhattan, and even entire family weekends inside Attica State Penitentiary. I can still remember my first trip to Rikers like it was yesterday. It was a dull gray morning. My family and I had gotten up extra early to make the trip into New York City. We all piled into our old wood paneled station wagon and started off. I remember my nervousness as we entered the Rikers Island parking lot. A light mist seemed to cut us off from the rest of the world. The tall gray walls and barbed wire fences only added to the atmosphere. 
Because my father had been in the hospital recuperating from his wounds, it had been several weeks since I'd last seen him. And it was pretty obvious, even to a seven-year-old, that this was going to be a strange day. A bus took us across a bridge to the main facility where we were frisked for any prohibited items. And then we were walked down a long hallway lined with cells that provided privacy for the family's visiting inmates. A guard opened the door to one of the cells and I saw my father sitting in an orange jumpsuit. And he stood up and smiled and he took his time giving me a hug. And then we sat down across from each other at the table. The first thing I noticed was the long surgical scar that ran across his chest and up his neck where the doctors had tried to remove the bullet that was lodged inside him. I remember the whole time trying not to stare at it. And while he and my mother sat in conversation and he declared his innocence to her over and over, I sat wondering how his being in prison would affect our family life. That first trip was nerve wracking, but as the weeks turned into months, it all became routine to have to pass through armed guards and barbed fences in order to see my father. This went on for years, but eventually my mother remarried and we decided as a family to discontinue any further contact with my father. We also changed our names so as to hide our identity from the community in which we live. People's reactions, well, I'll say that it's certainly unusual when an American citizen admits to being the son of the first member of a bin Laden organization to shed blood on American soil. Shame for what my father had done and fear for how I would be judged for his actions had caused me to hide my identity from most of those who knew me. I realized at a young age I had to be careful who I told my life story to. People's reactions have ranged from nervous laughter and shock to outright anger and threats against my life. I even once sustained a defensive wound as I tried grabbing a knife from the hand of someone I thought was a friend as he lunged at me exclaiming, I'd be doing this country a service if I killed you. Thankfully, I was able to escape without any serious injury. By the time I turned 19, I had already moved 20 times in my life. That instability during my childhood didn't really provide an opportunity to make many friends. Each time I'd meet one or two people I began to feel comfortable around, it was time to pack up and move to the next town. And being the perpetual new kid at school, I was frequently the target of bullies. So for the most part, I spent my time at home, reading books and watching TV or playing video games. For those reasons, my social skills were lacking, to say the least. And growing up in a bigoted household, I wasn't prepared for the real world. I had been raised to judge people based on arbitrary measurements like a person's race or religion. So what opened my eyes? One of the major turning points came when I found a summer job at Bush Gardens, an amusement park in Florida. There I was exposed to people from all sorts of faiths and cultures and it proved to be fundamental to the development of my character. You see, I was able to contrast the stereotypes that I'd been taught as a child with real life experience and interaction. And it didn't take long for me to realize the disservice I was doing to myself and those I was compelled to judge. Being exposed to the outside world allowed me to recognize my own moral failing. And it showed me that a, pay, a person's race, religion, or sexual orientation had nothing to do with the quality of one's character. I had a discussion with my mother not long after that about how my worldview was starting to change. And she said something to me that I will hold dear to my heart for as long as I live. She looked at me with the weary eyes of someone who'd experienced enough dogmatism to last a lifetime and said, I'm tired of hating people. And it sounds so simple, but it was so profound for me that I often fight back tears just thinking about it. It wasn't just that you could see the toll that all of those years of dealing with death threats and lawyers and the FBI and police, being ostracized everywhere she went, but it was also like she was giving me permission to go out into the world and experience people unencumbered by the prejudice that I had been taught.
In these times of increased religious prejudice, I feel sharing my story helps bring greater context to the debate over religious extremism. And that lesson served to me as a reminder that we must work together in order to achieve those goals. Each time we divide people into smaller and smaller groups based on one arbitrary distinction or another, we create communities ingrained with hostility toward one another. People can become frustrated when they think one side cannot or will not understand their point of view. This is one of the reasons that I promote interfaith dialogue, because I feel that it's one of the most useful tools for encouraging solidarity within our community. And when I say dialogue, I don't mean that we pile everyone into a room to debate who's right and who's wrong. All I'm talking about is simple interaction, sharing a meal together, or working together on a community project. It not only aids in dispelling false stereotypes and prejudices, it helps to create stronger, safer communities. Opening up dialogue will promote mutual respect and understanding among all faiths and cultures. And fortunately, we're seeing a larger number of uh, books and websites that illustrate how you can utilize uh, local politicians, community centers, and schools to promote a, a structured form of interfaith dialogue. And I really encourage everyone here to look into the different ways that they can become involved. For a time, I chose not to come out with my story because I was ashamed for what my father had done. But today, most times you hear about Islam or the Middle East in the news, it's usually related to some form of extremist behavior. And I knew that I could use my story to combat that negative stereotype. If I could show people that although I had been subjected to this violent, intolerant ideology, that I did not become fanaticized. That if I could choose a better path, then anyone can. Wherever I speak, the subject inevitably turns to groups like ISIS and what can be done to combat people willing to go to such brutal lengths for their beliefs. And to that, my answer is a relatively simple one. Don't give in to fear. Do not allow the actions of a radical group to alter our society in a way that further alienates nonviolent citizens marginalized by a fearful majority. Groups like ISIS traffic in fear and anger. <clears throat> Religion is used as a cloak for men like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. But it is those human emotions, anger, fear, the isolation that bind the rank and file. And that's where we can make the difference. This is why we must choose peace. Killing them doesn't work. You can't bomb people into a democracy. These ideologies cannot be destroyed with guns or missiles. We live in a system designed by human beings. They are not perfect, and we have the power to change them. One of the interesting effects of being in the public eye is that I'm never more than a few clicks away. And one day, I just happened to be waking up and checking my email, and I saw an email from the Bureau of Prisons saying that an inmate would like to begin communication with you. And I thought to myself, well, who could this be? And sure enough, it was my father. And it told me I had 10 days to decide yes or no to the communication. Now, before I ever began speaking publicly, I knew that I, at some point I wanted to speak to my father again. I had so many questions that I had thought about for most of my life. Why did you choose this path? Was it for fame or to feel a part of something greater than yourself? Why wasn't your family enough? And I knew I wanted to ask him these questions. I thought to myself, what if he died in prison and I never got the opportunity? So I clicked yes. Our emails back and forth began innocently enough. And frankly, I think I entered into it 
Rather naively, I thought I would ask him these deep questions that I had thought about for most of my life, and he would answer them honestly, and I would have some kind of revelation from his answers. But of course, that's not generally how life works. He told me initially that he supported my work promoting peace, and that he too, from his prison cell, had been advocating for a peaceful resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And he seemed to be sincere in that effort. Uh, he sent me letters to dignitaries and politicians and religious leaders all over the world. But as our communication continued, and he found out that I was no longer a Muslim, his, his tone took on a different, uh, took on a different character. I'd ask him these deep questions and he would basically respond that it was all God's plan and if I just returned to Islam that all of the problems or all the, the negative impact that his actions had on my life would go away, which is not something that an atheist wants to hear. Eventually I decided quite disheartedly that I couldn't be in communication with him anymore. It was too unhealthy for me. And I was extremely disappointed that I didn't get some sort of emotional fulfillment from our conversation. But after a few months of thinking about his answers, I realized that in fact he had given me what I was looking for. His worldview led to a narrow and oversimplified version of this world we live in. And I realized that his answers had no value for me. And in some strange way, although not what I wanted to hear, he gave me the answers that I was looking for. It took me a long time to see through all of the emotions that our conversation had brought to the surface, but in that time I realized that although it wasn't what I expected, I felt a sense of fulfillment. And as I mature I realized that the only way that I can overcome the challenges of my past, which at times has been crippling, is to help others understand that hatred only produces more hate. But belief in nonviolence at least provides an opportunity to heal. That those cycles of violence don't have to continue forever. I am not my father. And with that simple fact, I stand here as proof that violence isn't inherent in one's religion or race and the son does not have to follow the ways of his father. And should we fulfill our obligation to live peacefully and to put in the work needed in order to obtain peace, however difficult it can sometimes be, that ultimately will leave this earth a better place for the ones we love. Thank you very much. Thank you.